Welcome to Beyond BIM. In today's episode, we discuss the state of digitization in the built environment and the inevitable transition from BIM to digital twins. Now, this is a topic we have covered numerous times on this podcast, but today's guest is a widely recognized academic and entrepreneur. I will be speaking with Dr. Issa Ramaji, assistant professor at Roger William University and co-founder of Data Arrows. Issa is well known in the built environment scientific community. He's the associate editor of the very notorious ASC Journal of Architectural Engineering. In addition to that, he's leading the data and interoperability group in the Digital Twin Consortium. I sat down to talk to Issa about digital twins and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic using digital twins, and also about the gradual transition and what it could look like in the built environment as we move from BIM to digital twin. In our discussions, Issa also reminds our academic listeners not to fall into the trap of the latest or the newest technology and to ultimately question the purpose or the problem that we are trying to solve as researchers. And now let's take a listen to what Issa has to say on digital twins in the built environment. So Issa, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what led you to your research work into computerization, automation, and digitization of the built environment in the first place? Uh, Yeah, my interest in digitization and automation was formed when I transitioned from a consulting firm to a construction company earlier in my career. I got my bachelor's and master's in civil engineering uh, with structural and equipment focus. Uh, And then I started my career as a bridge engineer. Uh, There was a cable estate bridge project in which I was part of a design team. And uh, it was toward the end of the project that I received an offer from the contractor of the project that wanted me to join them and design their construction methodology and sequence of activities. Well, obviously I embraced the opportunity as as it enabled me to work on on building a bridge that I had designed. So that was such a unique opportunity and I absolutely embraced it. it was during that time that I realized the gap between the designers and the, con- and the contractors in terms of collaboration and communication. And I realized how simple design decisions uh, could have a dramatic impact on construction of a facility. So after a few years of working in the construction field, I decided to do my PhD in architectural engineering at, at Penn State. Uh, and and So there I learned more about technologies like building information modelings and and communication between different stakeholders in in, in the industry. And um, I had the opportunity to work on BIM and modular buildings. And after graduation, I just continued my career in academia. And on top of that work within academia, you're also the co-founder of Data Arrows, Inc. So what it was the original incentive to create this company and what is its penultimate mission? Yeah, when I was a student at Penn State, I met a colleague, Esam Mustavi, who is currently my partner at Data Arrows. Uh, he was doing research on occupant-centric operation of buildings. I was doing research on building information modeling. So we always had this discussion of... Uh, so we create these valuable BIM models for buildings through design and construction, but we stop using it after the construction is over or limit the use of the model to maintenance and updating the as-built model. Uh, so, uh, you know, the operation stage of a building has a much higher cost, length, and environmental impact compared to design and construction phases combined. And, and BIM has a lot of potential in addressing several challenges that we are facing in operation of building. So Esther and I always were discussing this shortcoming and uh, it was during that time that the passion for developing a BIM-based solution for building operation was formed. So, uh, so we stayed for him, obviously, and in 2019, uh, we decided to took this idea to the next step. So in a few, we kind of um, incorporated data arrows and started developing a digital twin platform to enable owners uh, to operate their facilities more efficiently and more intelligently. I think you already mentioned it briefly there on digital twins, but um, Data Arrows is 
obviously use digital twin technology also in supporting and helping schools during the pandemic. So can you describe a little bit more about how you did that? What did that look like? And what are the potentials of digital twins to assist during the pandemic? So, yeah, it was, so the, the, the digital twin platform we had uh, developed was uh, a very generic purpose, uh, dig- building digital twinning platform. And after the pandemic had, we had started, we had started thinking about how this technology can help schools and, and, and commercial buildings to, to reopen. Because if you want to reopen, you have to occupy buildings. And if you want to occupy buildings, you have to make sure you're providing a safe and healthy indoor condition uh, to the occupants. Uh, so we have started extending our platform uh, for this specific need. And we realized a, a specific need in schools. They wanted to reopen, and uh, they, they usually have in the U.S., they usually have dated facilities. They usually, they, those buildings usually don't have uh, capacity for providing the enough fresh air and, uh, and providing enough ventilation that is suggested by by CDC, um, Department of Health, and, 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 and health organizations like that. So they had started leveraging natural ventilation for, for the spaces. So they really didn't know how the building is performing. They were uh, kind of uh, doing their best uh, in terms of providing fresh enough fresh air to the building without knowing if this is sufficient, if they are overdoing it or not. Because because also overdoing that is also a problem because you are wasting energy, you are making occupant, you're making students uncomfortable. So they had to come up with a balance between providing a health healthy air to students and at the same time keeping them comfortable and minimizing energy waste. And that's where we, we, we realized that we have, we can contribute to that. And then we started uh, extending our digital twin platform to, to help uh, them uh, assess their building in real time to make sure the condition is, is safe. And, and, and beside that, uh, it also helped them to kind of look at the performance of their building and, and identify the areas that they need to improve in their building. Uh, because, you know, digital twin is like an x-ray for your building. So yeah. if if you have a broken bone, you want to know how it look like, where's the, what's the location, and then uh, plan for a treatment. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing. I mean, digital twin also help many of the schools to kind of identify the areas, like add, maybe adding a window, maybe malfunctioning of, of the HVAC system on a portion of the buildings. Uh, so things of that nature. It, it, it helped uh, schools to uh, to identify those issues and plan for them. It seems to me like what you guys did there was also probably make BIM more accessible to those that are managing and using the school buildings and spaces. And I think it probably leads me on to the next question, which is, how do you see overall the industry making that transition from BIM into digital twin and is it a small step or a giant leap how far are we from achieving that yeah that's a very good question Uh, so before answering that let's let's talk about digital twin and the definition of that so there are several definitions for digital twin in the literature Uh, i did a search on different definition and i and i could summarize them in in this uh, uh, statement a digital twin is a virtual representation of a physical system in which physical attributes, behavior, environment, real-time status, and historical information is captured. So this is, I mean, it kind of summarizes majority of the definition that exists in the literature. So, so with that definition, digital twin is not really a new thing. Look at your car dashboard. It's a simple digital twin of your car. It's a virtual representation of your car. It shows you the real-time status of your car, how much gas you have, how far you can go with the available gas in your tank. It shows historical data, like what's the mileage of your car. Yeah. It also analyzes your system and gives you alerts, like your tire pressure alert or engine light. So this is just a simple example. And, and then we can find many more examples for digital twin in the objects we use in our daily activities. Well, a novel early, uh, early age example for digital twin is application of this technology in Apollo 13 in 1950s. Uh, uh, and they, they use this technology to simulate scenarios of failure 
for Apollo. So uh, in the beginning, the application was limited only to scientific and industrial project, but it's now widely leveraged in even consumer products. So what now for, for the building industry, a digital twin in its modern form uh, is perceived as a model that combines BIM with real-time data of facility. Because in digital twin, we need to combine building static information with building dynamic information. Well, Bill can capture the static information and the dynamic information could be fed to the twin using technologies like IoT or artificial intelligence. So with that, BIM is a foundation for digital twin. And it's fair to say that transition from BIM to digital twin will be gradual. And the more integration we develop between BIM and other information technologies, the more comprehensive digital twin models we will have. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that gradual transition there with the digital twin. I think a lot of the industry is still, you know, they're still even grappling with BIM, let's say the SMEs in particular. But um, another issue that often comes across is, again, the ownership of the digital twin. How much does the client is, you know, are they fully aware of the need for a digital twin? Are they necessarily going to use the digital twin at the end? Who would actually benefit from it the most is another question that always crops up because we have so many stakeholders involved, particularly in the built environment, which tend to be quite fragmented due to the nature of the contracts and the nature of our industry. So I wonder whether that's something you might have come across in your experience with the schools and uh, perhaps with any other industry uh, practitioners. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think what 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 unique attribute uh, of of digital twin is it can deliver information in an easy, understandable way to users. I'll give you an example. Like, like if you want to talk about, if, so let's talk about ventilation in a building. If we just show graphs and some engineering terms to the owners or parents or uh, managers of or principals of schools, probably they are not interested in digging into those. Now, if you visualize that in 3D or if, if you color code information and they show the critical uh, issues with red and then the, 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 the kind of uh, um, safe condition with green, now the information starts to make sense to people. And, and the, the more comfortable users are with, with, uh, with, with the information, the, with the way information is presented, the more you will we will pay attention uh, to it. So I think I think this is the unique attribute of, of digital twin. And at the same time, digital twin enables uh, managers to manage their asset uh, holistically. So they don't have to work with two, three, four different dashboards to kind of monitor different aspects of your of, of their facility. They have they can have, they can see everything under under one dashboard and then see the impact of one and the others. I mean the example is is the school uh, in terms of uh, thermal satisfaction, like a comfort and health. So you so if you can see them at the same time in one dashboard, you can balance them. But if you're using two different systems for monitoring and managing them, probably it's going to be very hard to to kind of uh, to to find a balance between the two. But would you say that the digital twin in this case should be something quite centralized, or um, is it something that needs to be decentralized? So when you say you have to have information from all the different facets that might be of interest to you as the asset manager, is the digital twin kind of this centralized, uh, holistic way of capturing that? I think the value starts when you you integrate data and then look at the performance of your building holistically. I mean, seeing what's the impact of your occupancy schedule on your energy and and that on the health and and, and that on the performance of your HVAC system. So looking at all these holistically, definitely uh, generates a lot of value. But I don't think uh, that we can expect, in terms of technology development, that we, we, we can have one technology addressing all needs of the building. I mean, with BIM, it has been proven that 
it's not a working model. It's not a working model to think about a big black box that put everything in it and then use it for, for all use cases. It's been proven. That was, that was, that was a lesson we learned with BIM. And with the digital twin, it's the same. So uh, again, I think it's, it would be very beneficial to integrate interrelated uh, information in one digital twin platform, but having one digital platform for, the, for managing the whole aspect of buildings, it sounds like a dream, but uh, I'm not confident if this is practical or not. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Now, in addition to the work that you did uh, during the pandemic, you're also leading the data and interoperability working group at the Digital Twin Consortium. Can you just briefly introduce us to what is the Digital Twin Consortium and what exactly is your group doing within that consortium? The Digital Twin Consortium is a a relation between uh, industry, academia, some governments, and uh, we have have big companies involved like Microsoft, Dell, OMG, Lendlease. uh, And the the goal is to form a community uh, to kind of accelerate adoption of this technology in the industry. And not only for the building industry, it has multiple verticals from aerospace uh, to manufacturing, infrastructure, and so on. So uh, in, in data and durability group, uh, we, we kind of search different standards that could be used for, uh, for the digital twin uh, community and then identify gaps and, 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 uh, try to maybe develop them or work with, uh, with developers of the current, current uh, standards uh, to, to address the need of our industry. Also, uh, we, are, we are working on different use cases to, sh- to kind of showcase the, the benefits and potential of digital twin to the, to the industry. And with regards to the data and interoperability work group, what are some of the challenges that you're looking at when it comes to digital twins? So the, the, so the problem is like, what if you are staying in one industry? Like, let's talk about interoperability in BIM. So we're talking about design construction um, and uh, maintenance information exchanges. And we have a lot of issues. We have different terminologies. We have multiple standards. Now, when it comes to digital twin, you are not working only with your industry. You are working with electrical engineers. You are working with some manufacturers, some, some many other industries. So now this, uh, this problem becomes even more profound because you're not dealing with 10 uh, various standards. You're dealing with maybe hundreds and thousands of different standards. And you know, the, it's the, the cost of transition from one standard to another standard is it's very expensive for the industry in general. So I think, I think that's, the, that's, that's one of the main challenges that we have numerous standards uh, in, in this industry, I mean, not in our industry, our industry and its interface with other industries, and then convincing people to adopt only one uh, and then have the same terminology when you're talking about information. I think that's, that's the, the most challenging part of, of digital twin. Yeah, I think when you talk about data and interoperability with digital twin, the first concept that comes to mind, this is the one that I've come across that they talk a lot about in aviation and the defense sector is the digital thread. So to try and uh, develop the digital thread. And part of that is how well can that data actually be passed on and communicated or linked with one another? Is that sort of the direction that your group is heading towards? Yes, exactly. So we are working on how we can uh, make the connection different between different different uh, data points easier. Uh, so, as you said, I mean each 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 device, like it, whether it's a sensor you're building, whether whether uh, it's uh, is is a controller of your HVAC system. So each of these is is creating data uh, frequently, and then if you want to integrate them, you have multiple uh, kind of digital thread going in, 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 into one data repository. Now, now that data repository should, should know the language of 
many different technologies in order to be able to receive information, parse them, and then probably analyze them and communicate uh, information back to those devices. And I think, I think very, that's where the, the, the issue uh, of interoperability exists in Digital Twin. Okay, so Issa, you're also the associate editor of quite a well-known journal, the ASC Journal of Architectural Engineering. Now, can you shed some more light on how the academic discourse and debate on digitization and automation in the built environment has evolved more recently? Is it more towards talking about concepts like digital twin, or are there still some uh, major debates going on that our listeners might be interested in hearing about? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I was actually thinking about those things uh, and uh, I was kind of monitoring this change to see how things are changing in terms of uh, uh, research topic. And I noticed that during the last decade, uh, most of, the, not most, I mean, the fo- research projects were focused mainly on integration of data, interoperability and information management and information exchanges, model exchanges, or things of that nature, just being able to communicate the information you are creating with others and centralizing that in one uniform uh, uh, kind of environment. Now, and I see a transition, the trend has been transitioning toward using these data for generating values in different use cases. So because, okay, now we have this data. So now that's what's next. Uh, Because uh, we don't want to integrate data just for the sake of integrating data and then having everything in one place. Once we have data from different aspects of your building in one place, that's where... Uh, the real potential for generating values out of out of that information starts. Uh, so now I see uh, a lot of projects are being defined on, I don't know, like using AI to analyze this information and use it for automation of a system control in a building. So I think I think that's a present. Instead of collecting data, now we're working on using data. Yeah, that that makes sense. And what about in the classroom then and in the education? How has that changed, uh, especially given the nature of the fast-paced advancements in technology? So maybe you can talk about your experiences as an educator as well. How do universities and educators keep up with the pace of change? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, about a decade ago, like when, when a lot of universities started to kind of implement BIM in their curriculum, they mostly started with uh, developing a new course, usually called BIM, and then teaching BIM lessons in that course. And, and most of the cases that that course was elective. Now, now the transition I'm seeing happening is instead of isolating all the BIM lessons in one course, they are kind of spreading those lessons across multiple courses, introducing that in the first year and then gradually teaching new uh, BIM use cases, the uses and BIM technologies in other courses, like for scheduling, for, for control, and so on. Uh, and I think BIM is going to be a new cat. I mean, in the past, I mean, you, you expected all the students know how to use CAT. Cat software. Now, I think BIM is the next cat. You need to know this is this is a communication tool. This is the this is this is the way you communicate with others, and, and this is this trend. And more adoption of BIM we are we are seeing in this. So I think we can. This is realistic to expect all students to to know BIM in order to be able to communicate with with other uh, team members and collaborate with others. Now, in terms of the pace of technology advance, I think I think this is more challenging for us as educators than students because those, I mean, students are very, I mean, the new generation are very tech savvy. We are talking about virtual reality. These kids were doing virtual reality games in their middle school and high school. Yeah. And, and, and then pick up on new technologies much, much faster than us. I mean, look at how I text and a 20 year old, uh, uh, for students' text, I mean, it takes me uh, three times, three three times as long to do to type the same text. So I think I think uh, 
their skills and capabilities are very aligned with the pace of technology advancement. Now it just, I think, I think the challenges are the challenges for educators, not students. For sure, and I'm I'm guessing that you've you've probably witnessed that universities have had to change some of their approach in educating that younger generation as well. Finally, I would like to just maybe ask more about some advice for any aspiring researchers or academics. So do you have any advice or any golden piece of advice you might give to an early career researcher, somebody who's just starting out their research career and particularly in our field, maybe in construction and the built environment, what kind of advice would you give to them when they're trying to make an impact with their research? Uh, not an advice, but uh, I've noticed there is a trap in academia that many of us could fall into it. And that's doing research and using some new technologies for the sake of just experiencing new technologies. So in many cases, it leads to um, technologies or researchers, research projects that are not practical to be implemented in the industry or they have such a narrow scope that uh, doesn't get much attention from the industry. And again, this, this is, this, we, this, there is an excitement in experiencing new technologies. So that's why I'm calling it trap because it's very attractive to try them. But at the same time, sometimes we forget that uh, we, are, we are doing this to make an impact on, on the industry. So I think, and then I think, uh, with more collaboration between between the industry and uh, and uh, the academia, this this problem could be minimized because the industry. I'm talking about technology companies and, and new ventures developing new technologies. Uh, they can benefit a lot from the knowledge that exists in academia, and at the same time, they can help academia to identify. Uh, the needs of the industry and the technology that can have a real impact on, on, on the industry. So I think the more collaboration we see between academia and industry, the more impact we'll see from academia on industry. Yeah, I 100% agree with you on having kind of a foot in both domains, academia and industry. Now, I guess finally, the other thing is for our researchers and other interested listeners, they will probably want to know what kind of research are you currently working on and where could they find out more about your research work and its resources? Yeah, my, my, my research is currently uh, focused on occupant-centric operational buildings and using artificial intelligence for building automation. And uh, also I'm doing research on, on uh, I've been doing research on modular building and I'm shifting toward using robotics uh, during uh, manufacturing and construction of industrial construction. And uh, I usually post updates on my publication and projects on my LinkedIn page. And finally, a heartfelt thank you to all of our followers who have been with us so far. If you enjoyed this episode, then please follow us on LinkedIn or YouTube. And better yet, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.